my favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Tecco, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground moving the needle in public health and medicine. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Dr. John Brownstein, Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital and a professor at Harvard Medical School. He has his PhD in epidemiology from Yale University, but his resume, as impressive as it sounds, doesn't even begin to shed light on what John actually does. He's an innovator, having started several public health initiatives, including healthmap.org, which offers real-time intelligence on emerging infectious diseases, StreetRx, which crowdsources the black market for prices of prescription drugs, and most recently, Vaccine Finder, which is the only centralized database of vaccine availability in the U.S. As I always say, most healthcare problems have a root in social justice, and today we'll talk about John's latest project to increase access to the COVID-19 vaccine. John, how are you? Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So you are one of the first people I've heard called a digital epidemiologist. What does that even mean? Right. Well, it is not someone who studies disease of the fingers, as some people have referred it to. Uh, (laughs) It is all about trying to tap into the amazing amount of data that exists online to try to elucidate patterns, whether it's understanding patterns of disease, people's attitudes and beliefs, um, health behaviors, the, the amount of rich data that comes in what you search for online, what you like in social media, what you tweet about, all that information collectively can say a lot about an individual, but at a population level, it can give us massive amount of information, whether it's an emerging infectious disease, whether it's understanding, you know, abuse of prescription drugs, whether it's understanding sort of a gun violence because that data isn't collected. It especially gives you insights into things that either cannot be collected by public health or are just really hard to collect. And, you know, there's incredible wealth of data that is just at our fingertips and generated as part of your everyday life. And how much of this was embedded in your academic experience versus something you just picked up on the job given all of your interests? I guess what I'm asking is, how far behind are we in academia for the digital part of digital epidemiology? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that public health often is very slow at adapting. I was involved in the space, I guess, probably about 15 years ago. I was trying to work with electronic medical record data to essentially get important patterns about adverse drug events, you know, understanding flu epidemics, get tapping into clinical data, super tough highly siloed, challenging for many reasons, and you couldn't do it in real time or have broad sort of geographic um, sort of visibility. And so we recognized that there was all this data online. And if you started mining and and bringing the sort of the new concepts of, of natural language processing and machine learning, you could really build public health surveillance tools in ways that you couldn't have imagined. And this is how we started healthmap.org, which was tracking the emergence of, you know, whether it's Ebola in West Africa, H1N1 in Mexico, Zika in the Americas, you could get all this deep in- insight into what's happening on the ground just by, you know, mining existing sources online and without having to deal with the challenges of tapping into clinical data. What sort of IRB approval process do you have to go through for data that's captured from public data sets like Twitter? Is it the same as if you were doing more clinical research? Yeah. Well, we've definitely challenged our IRB in many ways by bringing these kind of data sets that we're not used to in clinical research. Because it's public data, for the most part, 
you know, it changes sort of how we can utilize it. It's data that's, you know, out there for public consumption. Now we do get IRB approval and oftentimes we get, you know, exempt because it's public data. And, and what we do, even though we're using natural language processing, we're aggregating the data, we're not displaying individual information, but, you know, it still has to go through the right approval processes, which is really interesting because, you know, anytime you tweet something, a hundred ad retargeting companies are grabbing that data and, and grabbing all sorts of elements about you and, and pushing advertisement in your direction. And then, but on the clinical side, you know, we're <laughs> to a slightly different, you know, we're trying to do a public health project. It uh, you know, it has to go through a really extreme review where we can do that kind of work. Ugh, the irony of it. Yeah. So let's talk about what was going on in early 2020 when COVID was popping up as a problem in China and we didn't have a good understanding of what was going to happen here. I imagine your epi radar was going off like crazy. So I want to hear what was in your head in January, February of 2020. Yeah, well, listen, I think that, you know, we had been running surveillance tools for many years, but to be honest, like things were really underfunded. I mean, we were running a team on a real shoestring budget because, you know, we know that these pandemics generate a lot of funding, but when there's no emerging infectious disease threat, funding is really tight. But we were running our surveillance tools at the end of December of 2019, we detected a news media source out of Wuhan talking about a mysterious uh, pneumonia that was impacting a handful of residents. And that was the first sort of signal outside of China that something was happening. And, you know, we fed that information to the WHO and, and that was part of sort of this group of tools that were sort of trying to elucidate or provide situational awareness of what was taking place on the ground. But, you know, it was really into January and February, we recognized that, that something was really wrong and, you know, that this, you know, emerging virus had the characteristics of something that, um, in fact, I was an advisor in the movie Contagion. And, you know, when you think about sort of trying to develop a uh, pathogen that, you know, can bring the world down, you know, unfortunately, like COVID had a lot of those characteristics. And so, you know, we, of course, were incredibly concerned and trying to push to declare a pandemic. But from a, from an epi perspective, you know, we were, we've been off to the races and building tools to support surveillance, uh, understanding of, you know, symptomology initially, like trying to understand like, well, what is the characteristic as, of an infection, how to understand emergence in communities, and then like, does masking work at the community level? You know, can we understand sort of what, you know, um, what holidays when people travel, what that does to the spread? And of course, now understanding the impact of vaccines. And so it's been, you know, nonstop for, for many months, uh, trying to offer as much support to response as possible. So the way I describe your work is that you lead a lot of special projects. The one that is most timely and perhaps most impactful is the vaccine finder. I have a lot of questions about this, but first is we literally have something called the Center for Disease Control, but projects like yours and the COVID tracking project, they were led by volunteer nonprofit groups. What does it mean that all of these tools that are necessary for fighting an outbreak started without federal support and outside of the CDC? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this. And of course, I think the COVID tracking project is one of these like amazing examples of a grassroots effort, which, you know, sole purpose to provide better visibility on underlying cases and, you know, how the virus is spreading in the community. You know, that was really, you know, eye opening in my view, because, you know, we should have had those kind of resources at the CDC, but also the public health level. I think that, you know, right. If we had COVID emerged now, it might look different. Of course, now you look at the CDC website, there are an incredible amount of data resources. So there has been a bit of a, uh, an awakening of some of those you know, efforts that, you know, for whatever reason, never emerged, you know, th- the earliest of the pandemic when we really needed them. It also tells us that, you know, local public health is severely unfunded. And the way that we do public health in this country, where we provide, you know, empower the, at the local level makes sense for a variety of reasons, but it also creates this super diffuse, you know, landscape of IT systems that are uncoordinated and don't talk to each other and make it really hard to get, you know, real-time reporting at scale. So it, it is really disheartening. I, obviously, right at this moment, we've seen a bit of a change. And you handed the keys over, right? So vaccinefinder.org is now vaccinefinder.gov? Right. 
the difference with Vaccine Finder is that, you know, Vaccine Finder has been around for eight years. We actually took it over from Google after H1N1, but then we enlisted help with HHS. And then eventually CDC has been our partner on vaccinefinder.org for many years. And we redeployed it for, you know, COVID. That is through CDC support. And really, I think it represents the best opportunities around government and sort of partnerships with academic or, you know, nonprofit institutions where, you know, there was a recognition, there was a resource that existed and there was no reason to replicate it or try to do another, another version of it. So it's CDC, but then plus us. And then we brought in the company Castlight Health, you know, public company, and then, you know, Mapbox. And now we're working with Twilio. So it's a really great combination of companies, academic groups, and the government to build a tool around vaccine uh, availability and access. So I think that actually represents, a, you know, a, a real positive, and especially um, the involvement of the US uh, DS, USD Digital Service, has really come in and, and been an incredible uh, supporting organization to get this off the ground. Interesting. So it started at Google.org, was handed over for the first time. You guys streamlined the process, grew it, yes, and then now it sounds like it's a group effort, but the government is the sole owner of the project with your support. Yes, so it's it's still actually interestingly enough, um, we are still running the website as a .dot gov um, in combination with CDC and HHS, uh, but we're actually still you know supporting it, running it, you know, the servers are, you know, working with Castlight, you know, so it's, it's actually still represents this combination uh, of collaborations, but now all featured on a gov website, which I actually think is maybe the first time or one of the only times this has happened. Um, and it's working great. Yeah. Well, COVID tracking project is a little different story, right? Yes. A couple of people were just aggregating the data from news outlets across counties, cities, and states that no one was collecting so that we could have a better picture of the national testing and case count. So how did this not exist? Right. Well, listen, I think parts of it existed, but you know, it is really concerning that uh, there wasn't the full capability. And I, I, I think there, again, there are a lot of reasons for why this didn't exist. I think we had tools along these lines, like the Biosense system at CDC that's existed for, for many years. I think that we still have this challenge of getting states to fully share data in a timely fashion. And then, you know, there was never been a big push to make data public, surveillance data really public and downloadable and usable by the research community. We do this to a certain degree with flu, but never at this scale or in this, you know, in, in a pandemic situation. So unfortunately, there was a lot of building the plane as you were flying it. And, you know, yeah, you know, and government agencies aren't that nimble. And so there was just, you know, and then there's, you know, the political undertones of like, do we, you know, is this important to do? Because, you know, arming the public with data may make them recognize that this is a real problem that we have to respond to, as opposed to something that we can sweep under the rug. So there's definitely that part of it as well. And you're Canadian. Yes. <laughs> do you still have family there? Are you following how Canada yeah. has? Yeah. Okay, so just contrast the experiences within the public health community in the U.S. versus Canada during COVID. You know, it's super interesting because I would have given the, U the U.S. really poor marks and C Canada really high marks on, on how they've been able to respond. But that sort of has, has flipped a little bit. You know, so Canada took the pandemic super seriously. It, it made policy decisions. The population got on board. You know, there wasn't a big pushback on, you know, masking as an example. Like that wasn't, didn't become a political weapon. You know, everybody was on board with response and doing their part, which was great. And there was some really great, clear public health messaging. Now, I think it flipped, of course, when it came to vaccine rollout, where we saw the US really ramp up get its act together, get everyone on board. Canada was a little bit left hanging because they didn't have the supply and then they had variants come into the mix. And then they started really seeing that, you know, that fourth wave that we never experienced here in the US in a real way because vaccine rolled out. So unfortunately, Canada is a bit of a victim of just not having the access to vaccines. But I think there has been a lot of 
political, you know, sort of confusion around opening and lockdowns. And my family in Toronto has experienced that, you know, Toronto is probably has, uh, is probably the most lockdown city on the planet in terms of how they've had to deal with virus. Now, their case counts are about the same in, in, as most parts in the US, but they just don't have the, the healthcare capacity to, to handle influx of hospitalizations. Yeah. Are they starting to get the vaccine across Canada? Yes, exactly. So now, I mean, they, they're just slower, but no, they've now really started to ramp up supply. So so are you going to let them use vaccinefinder.gov? <laughs> they can use it. It won't work for them. But <laughs> they're, they're welcome. To, I mean, the number of Canadians that have come to the US for their first or second shot is quite significant. So wow, there's a lot of vaccine tourism taking place. I was talking with a hospital CEO discussing the vaccine rollout in the South, and he was saying that availability is no longer an issue for his employees. But I guess they're having a hard time getting some young women providers who are on the front lines and actually have a higher risk of exposure to get the vaccine. Wow. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding and fear around the vaccine's impact on fertility and pregnancy. I'm sure you've heard this one and many more myths or fears around the vaccine. Do you think this resistance will stop us from getting to herd immunity? Well, listen, I think there are a couple uh, good points to that. I I do think that there is the staunch anti-vax group that is out there, but I think it's maybe not as, as large as we think because these voices take up a lot of space online uh, that we, we tend to react very severely to them. Um, for good reason, because the misinformation is so acute. But you know, there are many people that are on the on the fence and just you know questioning you know how important the vaccine is. You know, is it really necessary for me, or is it really my turn in line? I just want to wait and see. Those are the people that are really that can be convinced. And I think this is where access comes into play. How do we make it easy for people to get? How do we meet people where they are? How do we? you know, bring in mobile sites or door to door, you know, whatever it is, I think there are ways in which you sort of, you get people over the hump. We found this with flu immunizations. It's, it's about convenience. Um, and that can be a big driver. I think that, you know, this herd immunity concept is one that, you know, I've had a bit of concern with, because I think, I think it's unlikely we're ever going to be in a position where, you know, we've driven COVID out of the US and of course not the globe. The view is I think that COVID will become part of the seasonal mix of, of viruses. It may not be as severe because people have underlying immunity, but it will cause some amount of illness and deaths on a yearly basis, you know, on par with maybe influenza. You know, we don't know for sure. But I think, you know, that's unfortunately what we'll have to deal with because it's just going to be impossible to get to everyone and get to a point in which um, we've driven the virus out of the community. So if you look at misinformation as a virus, have you or any of your colleagues studied the r not or how contagious it is? Like how fast Facebook posts or memes spread across communities? Yeah. In fact, we've, I've been studying this for, for years. We actually were funding by Gates. Uh, on a platform we run ran called Vaccine Centimeter, we couldn't actually keep it funded. You know, we'd run it uh, for a few years, and then we just couldn't get any funding to support vaccine misinformation. Clearly, it would have been more helpful now. Um, but we've done a bunch of research, and you know, tracking how a rumor takes hold in social media. And what's interesting is that you know we classified sentiment of of, of you know rumors, and if say, someone says something. Um, negative about a vaccine, it generates more negativity about that vaccine. Someone says something positive, it also generates more negativity. So it's sort of this losing battle when it comes to- Wait, 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 wait. So if someone says something positive, it actually creates a negative sentiment? Yes. Why is that? You got to unpack that for me. Because people online are just generally much, and, and listen, they may have changed with COVID, but for years, this is what we would study is that it's this like, incoming wave of, of negativity around vaccines that was really hard to combat, which made it really challenging for organizations like the CDC to figure out how to deal with messaging if no matter what you do online, it generates more negativity. Now, right now with COVID, you, you see a lot of really positive sentiment and you see there's this effort that I think is wonderful called This Is Our Shot. And there's all sorts of great efforts to really get people on board. So that may have shifted a bit, but it's been for many years a really challenging issue. And, you know, I personally believe, 
and I thought of this before and it should have existed now, the whole discipline in understanding sort of real health communications. Of course, that exists broadly speaking, but how do you combat misinformation as a real scientific discipline is one that you know, really hasn't sort of taken hold where I think it's just as important as any other thing you could be doing in public health. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So you've been working in healthcare for a while, and we all face naysayers. Tell me something about one of the bigger roadblocks that you faced in your work, and who tried to stop you from doing your job? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I've had you know a lot of pushback on this digital field because people didn't recognize it as being real science, right? The idea that you could tap into Google search stream and make that usable data to get insights, um, it's not considered traditional epi. And, you know, in some ways, you know, public health is very, it's in its box, you know, clinical trials, maybe you can do a case control study, observational maybe, but when you tap into large data sets and you get findings and big data, uh, when I first started, like that was like, that was too far off and you couldn't, analyze data and control for all the biases and, and issues in a way that, you know, traditional data set. Now, of course, that has changed dramatically, but that was, a, that was a long time of like convincing journal articles and colleagues that the, this was like reasonable science to be pushing forward on. And so, yeah, that's been, that, that, I mean, just in terms of academic work, like that probably represents the, the, the biggest hurdle. Yeah. And now, I mean, every journal is constantly sharing observational studies pulled from these public data sets. Yeah. When did that shift happen and how did it happen? I, I don't know where researchers got on board with it. Of course, journals now have like specific journals dedicated, you know, Nature and Lancet all have specific journals dedicated to these ideas. But I don't know. I don't think there was like one tipping point. I just think there was a recognition, especially in other domains that were like really moving more quickly in in sort of data mining, machine learning. I think over time it just recognized like public health cannot just like or medical science can't wait to you know embrace some of these things. Yeah, I think you and I met in 2010, 11, and the early days of Rock Health. We heard many more no's than yeses. I'll say the tech community has always embraced and been very enthusiastic about. The application of technology in healthcare. Yeah. You have a lot of fans in the tech world. You <laughs> collaborate with a lot of them. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a tech person or a healthcare person? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, probably more a healthcare person, but I mean, what I've really sort of staked my career on has been like, okay, how do I bring these companies into a into the mix, right? So amazing relationships with companies like Google or, or Twitter, or Uber, or Amazon. How do you see what they're doing and see the opportunity to bring them in? Um, obviously, publish and but really, you know, because these are companies that you know will have resources well beyond anything we'll ever have in healthcare. So to try to replicate what they do in healthcare is, is a huge mistake. And so working with them has been the key. Yeah. Well, tell us about the Uber Health stuff that you're involved with. Yeah, so Uber Health actually funny. Should I, so Uber just started. I recognized that there was this like self assembling logistics platform that um, just didn't exist in healthcare. We have to move patients around. We have to move product around. We have to get 
healthcare to home. Um, but like, we don't have access to like that kind of a platform. So I actually wrote a support ticket <laughs> on the app after a ride and said, ride was great, but have you thought about healthcare? And it was like, just a, like a shot in the dark. And uh, someone on the other end responded to the support ticket and said, interesting, uh, can we have a meeting? And so a few people from Uber at the time, there, you know, that was a point where they actually looked at the support tickets and really like, you know, there wasn't, uh, this is actual engagement you can get off the app. They came to my office and I pitched them Uber Health, which was this idea initially um, that we could do vaccines on demand. And so we put um, nurses in Uber black cars and did flu shot. I actually did it one year. I did a flu shot. I remember. It's so cool. <laughs> so it was great. And they were, they were, they were awesome to work with, convinced them. I mean, listen, the lawyers involved to get, you know, needles in, you know, <laughs> Uber vehicles and getting people delivered and consented. Uh, that was no joke. And it was dead like 10 times before we ever could get off the ground. It got off the ground. Great you know, success. It was all about access. And then a whole vertical at Uber Emerge called Uber Health. Uh, and you know, that's a whole, that's like a big business line for them. I ended up building a company on top of Uber called circulation, which was all about patient logistics and getting, you know, patients to their appointments. Um, and you know, now this whole sort of on demand logistics and healthcare is a thing. And, you know, there's many companies doing lots of different interesting things in the space. And even Uber is doing COVID on demand, uh, vaccines were working with Moderna. So, um, you know, there's, it's, it still lives on, which is great. You seem to really thrive off having your hands in a lot of things at once, <laughs> and you're always just so busy. I'm curious if you can share a little more about what keeps you going. What's your North Star in all of this? Obviously, bring value to pu public health has always been sort of bread and butter of I excitement for me, um, dealing with important emerging threats to population health but finding ways in which we can respond. And I think I'm probably a builder in the sense that like, I, I really love that initial spark of an idea um, and whether it doesn't have to be incredibly novel, it's bringing you know, a concept from another industry into healthcare and getting it off the ground and sort of setting a whole sort of effort in motion and then bring other people to the party. And you know, I'm happy to then walk away and let a lot of other people figure out how to scale and operationalize um, you know, I probably get you know, the most excited at the earliest stage of the idea. Yeah, it's the zero to one. Yeah. And then someone else can take it from one to a hundred. Yeah. Right, exactly. I think that to me is like the most fun. Um, you know, when it's in scale or maintenance mode, it's, you know, yeah. plenty of people get excited by that. Um, but that's, you know, that's not like what drives me every time. But that means that I have my hands in a lot of things because you have ideas and then you're like, okay, I cannot do this thing. I got it, you know. So I, I, I've got to get it done and I got to find out resources and, and build a partnership, find the right people and, and make it happen. I feel like you're creating your own Langer Lab over there. <laughs> you may have already surpassed them in terms of how many spinoffs you've been able to create. It's been a lot. And especially now with the Accelerate the Hospital, I mean, we've been involved in dozens of companies and it's fun. I mean, you know, you know the same thing. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many companies you've had a hand in, but you know, there's unlimited enthusiasm for so many different things. It's hard, and I guess my North Star is like uh, people say it's FOMO, which is like I can't, like it's just like can't not. So like it just, <laughs> I'm driven by you know looking out, you know. Yeah. So what's next? You know, I don't know. I mean, honestly, like it's been pandemic at all times. Yeah. Um, and so I haven't given my space to think about anything else. It's trying to, you know, of course, get this vaccine rolled out, have real impact on getting, you know, millions of people immunized. And then I got to figure that out, right? Because, you know, what is interesting now is you've got huge amount of investment happening into public health right now, you know, the first time in a real way. So the question is, you know, do you double down in some of these efforts? We just launched this massive effort with Google and Rockefeller called global.health, which is a platform for open data sharing in public health emergencies, um, which was an amazing relationship with Google gave loaned us engineers for like six months to build this platform to respond to the future pandemic. So Definitely that's, you know, on the horizon as like, what do we do for the next response? But, you know, again, lo lots of lots and lots of ideas. Yeah, probably some case studies. You're going to have to just write up a lot of these key learnings. Yeah. It's such a moment in time. I think about the epi classes that I took and learning about the 1918 influenza pandemic. 
it was hard to connect for me because it was a different century. I'm imagining the public health case studies are being updated and written right now yes. for current and future students of public health. I, I totally agree. And I just hope that this learning gets coded and 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 extends because I'm, what I'm worried about is that there's a lot of people that injected themselves into public health and brought the best that we have to offer, but then those people will leave. And then what do we have left, you know, in public health? I mean, you could see that, you know, with the COVID tracking project that pushed the government to basically replicate the tools and now they have it. So that, that it seems that is like an important investment that is now going to be sustained, but there are plenty of other things that have happened that I'm worried will, you know, people will walk away and, and, and then all that amazing work will sort of go, go, go to waste. Yeah. And it's hard because within public health, oftentimes the efforts that are made to keep people healthy go unseen because people are healthy and you're just not thinking about it. It doesn't get the attention. This is why the resources tend to go to solving problems versus yeah. preventing them. Yeah, absolutely. We're just not good at investing in yeah. prevention. You know, we do not, you know, we care about the, the pathogen that's circulating. We don't care as much about the pathogen that is in reservoir animal populations ready to spill over. And then for, you know, if we could focus on that, we'd be in a much better place. Well, in closing, how can listeners support your work or learn more about what you're doing? They can go to compepi.org where um, we talk a lot about our projects. Obviously, go to vaccines.gov to take a look at what we're building on vaccine availability, global.health for a new effort in, in open data, health map. So, But all of that's listed on the CompEpi website, so definitely check it out. And how about get vaccinated? I mean, that is, <laughs> yes, that is 100% it. You know, get it, get it done. You know, there's plenty of availability out there. There's supply and it's the right thing to do for yourself, for your family, community, and to get to the other end of this pandemic. And it's free. Free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you for listening to the Heart of Healthcare podcast. If you liked today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare with Halle Teco is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producers are Holly Teco and Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seely and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seely. Our music is by Utah. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. That's offscript, no T, dot com.